Today's case will be about a mysterious, yet unsolved murder that took place on January 2, 1935. Then, on an average Wednesday afternoon, a man with dark brown hair and an elegantly dressed man wearing a dark overcoat rented a room at the President Hotel in Kansas City, occupied his room, but never left. There are a lot of suspicious circumstances behind the case, we might get closer to the solution by the end of the video. The mysterious man asked for a room on the top floor facing the courtyard, not the street. He checked in with the name Roland T. Owen and a Los Angeles address for a two-day stay, where he didn't take any bags with him. The hotel staff had already noticed a clearly visible horizontal wound behind his ear on his temple, and that he had so-called cauliflower ear. Employees said he may have been in his 20s. The man was given room 1046 on the top 10th floor, to which a Londoner named Randall Fraps escorted him up after check-in. According to the latter's later recollection, while they were on their way to his place, the man told him that he had spent the previous night in a nearby hotel, but he was surprised by the prices there. Finally reaching his room, Owen opened the door, the Londoner turned on the light, and then watched as the, the man takes out the black hairbrush, the black comb and the toothpaste from his coat pocket, which he had placed above the sink. After that, they both left the room. Not long after, the Londoner asked if he could go back to close the door. The man gave her the keys, promptly turned off the lights, then returned the keys, and they went down to the first floor together. The Londoner went about his business here, and Owen left the building upon reaching the lobby. All of this becomes particularly strange after a short time later, when the cleaner named Mary Soptic arrived for her afternoon shift. She thought she could go to work in the empty room, but at the same time she opened the door and saw the man sitting in the room's armchair. The woman apologized for bothering, but the man who logged in as Owen told her to just clean up. Apart from the fact that the man shouldn't have been there in principle, what made the situation even scarier was that he had drawn all the blinds and only the dimly lit night lamp next to the bed was on. According to the cleaner's later report, he visited the 1046 room a few more times during the day, but each time the man sat in the same dim darkness. He later told the police that he had the feeling that the stranger was worried or afraid of something, from something and as if he wanted to stay in the dark the whole time. In any case, why Soptic, after finishing the cleaning, she noticed that he was putting on his coat and combing his hair, and before leaving, she asked him to leave the door open, because his company would arrive in a few minutes. The cleaner did so, however, when he returned at four o'clock to change the towels, the room was completely dark, the lamp was not lit, only some light filtered in from the corridor, and then one only saw the unknown man lying in bed fully clothed. He also saw a handwritten note on his bedside table, on which it was written that I will quote you in 15 minutes and I will be here, wait. The woman left after that and did not see the stranger that day, but the hardest part was yet to come. The next day, January 3, 1935, Mary Soptic started cleaning around 10.30, but at the same time, 10.46 was closed. From this, he concluded that the guest had left the hotel, as the door could only be locked from the outside. However, when he opened the door again, the man was sitting again in the same place where he had been crying in the armchair the day before in silence and darkness, and suddenly the phone started ringing and the stranger answered on the other end of the line, no, I don't want to eat, I'm not hungry, I just had breakfast, no, I'm not hungry. Then, still holding the phone in his hand, he addressed the cleaning lady and inquired about her work, for example, whether she was responsible for the entire floor, and whether the President Hotel also operates as an apartment hotel. The latter is interesting because in such institutions you can rent not only average hotel rooms, but also ordinary apartments for a longer period. After the cleaning, Mary Soptic left again, the next time she returned only at four in the afternoon to bring the new towels, because she had taken the previous ones in the morning, but when she got to the door, she heard two men arguing about something inside, so the deep voice that answered first knocked to him, he was not familiar, and he asked who it was. The woman said that she had come to change the towels, but the deep voice rudely replied that we did not need it. All of this is interesting because at that time she had not been in the room since morning cleaning, so this happened at 4 p.m. However, two hours later, a 30-year-old woman named Jin Owen from a high school near Kansas City checked into the hotel after not feeling well after shopping that day, so she didn't want to go home. The woman got room 1048 two blocks away, and at 9.20 p.m. his partner who works in the city also visited him, who stayed there for about two hours. 
Jin Owen later told the police that he heard men and a woman loudly arguing and swearing from room 1046 that night. But there is another strange account of the phenomenon told by the nearby Neolithic operator. Blazer started his shift at midnight, and hotel guests began to quiet down after about 1.30 a.m., except for 10.55, where a party was being held that night. At the same time, among the people seen that night, he remembered a particularly well-dressed woman who had been seen earlier in the company of several men. According to some, she could even have been a prostitute. The elevator operator reported that he first encountered the woman sometime during the first half of his shift, going up to the 10th floor and inquiring about room 1026, but about five minutes later, the elevator was called to 10 again. Floor, where the woman was waiting and complained that the person she was looking for was not in her room. She also said that she had been called earlier by the man she was looking for, who was always very punctual about appointments. She also said that maybe she should have gone to room 1024 because the light was on there, and the light above the door the ventilation window was also open. The woman then waited on the 10th floor for about half an hour, then went down to the lobby, from where she went up to the 9th floor with another man, with whom she later left separately at quarter past six. The man was about six feet tall, thin, about 60 pounds, wearing a light brown overcoat, a brown hat and brown shoes. The woman was about the same weight and height as the man, but had black hair and wore a black seal grey coat. It is interesting that he was also noticed by one of the receptionists, who said that he saw the person in question go into the building several times that evening. It is worth mentioning another event from this evening, because it is possible that they ran into the unknown man on the street, a man named Robert Lee, from the city a man working in the waterworks was driving at the corner of 13th Street and Lydia Avenue, a 30-minute walk from the hotel, shortly before 11 p.m., when he saw a man running west on the north side of the road. The man was only wearing a pair of pants and a t-shirt. All this at the beginning of January, when it was quite bitterly cold outside. So all of a sudden this man started waving and yelling at Robert to stop and when that happened he apologized, because he thought he flagged down a taxi driver. Then he asked her to take him to a place where he could catch a taxi. Lane told him he looked like he had been beaten. The stranger's answer was that I will kill you tomorrow, and then he got into the car. On the way, however, the city worker noticed a deep scratch on the passenger's left arm, and that he was squeezing both hands as if he wanted to stop a bleeding. Finally, they reached an intersection, where the man thanked them for the ride, and then got into a taxi. But we will return to this little scene later. On January 4th, at 7 o'clock in the morning, Della Ferguson arrived at the technical fault in the hotel's telephone switchboard. She was supposed to start working, part of which included making a wake-up call to room 1046. However, the phone was unreachable, and the indicator light at the switchboard suggested that the handset was not in place, despite no one using it. Rudolph Drops, a bellboy, led the man to his room. When Drops went to check the issue, he found the door locked with a note hanging on the handle instructing not to disturb. This was odd since it was an externally lockable door. Drops knocked louder and a voice from inside told him to come in, but without a key, Drops couldn't enter. After more knocking, the same voice instructed him to turn on the lights. Drops still couldn't enter but shouted through the door for the man to put the handset back in its place. After this, Drops left. Downstairs, Drops informed the telephone operator that the guest, registered as Robert T. E. Owen, was likely drunk, so they should wait for an hour. When the wake-up call was attempted around 9.30, the operator found that the phone was still not in place. Another bellboy named Pike went to the room around 10.30, this time with a key. Despite the note still being on the door, Pike entered and found complete darkness. Using the faint light from outside, he noticed an unknown person lying naked on the bed in a seemingly intoxicated state. Though it was dark, Pike saw strange dark spots under the stranger on the bed. Instead of turning on the lights, he only placed the fallen telephone handset back in its place and left. Two hours later, around 10.30, another report came that the phone in room 1046 had moved again. This time, the first bellboy went to the room, but now it was locked and the note was still there. However, unlike Drops, he had a key and entered the room. Inside, he found a shocking scene. Approximately 60 centimeters from the entrance, the man was hunched on the floor, leaning on his knees and elbows, his bleeding head buried in his hands. The bellboy quickly put the phone back, turned on the lights, and saw that the walls, ceiling, 
bed and bathroom were covered in blood. He immediately ran for help and an assistant from the hotel accompanied him. However, when they returned, they could only open the door slightly as the man had collapsed on the floor. After a moment, he managed to stand up and the two hotel employees entered the room. In the bathroom, they found the man sitting on the edge of the tub. Meanwhile, the assistant informed the police and a doctor from the Central City Hospital joined them. It turned out the man's wrists, ankles and neck were tied with a cord and there were bruises around his neck. Multiple stab wounds were found on his chest, with one piercing his lung, and blows to his head had caused a fracture on the right side of his skull. All signs pointed to him being tortured, yet miraculously, he was still alive. When asked who did this to him, he replied, nobody. When questioned if he tried to commit suicide, he said, no. Shortly afterward, he lost consciousness and fell into a coma. Despite being immediately taken to the hospital, he never regained consciousness. On January 5th, just after midnight, the mysterious occupant of room 1046 passed away. The autopsy determined that he died due to his injuries, likely inflicted between 4 o'clock and 5 o'clock in the morning, which means during the time when the first bellboy knocked on his door at 7 o'clock and the second bellboy entered two hours later. The door, externally locked as a reminder, didn't prevent entry from the inside. Besides the label on his tie, no other belongings were found, as even his clothes were missing, along with soaps, towels, and shampoo. No weapon, such as a knife, associated with the stab wounds was found. The fingerprints on the phone, believed to be a woman's, didn't match the man or hotel staff. The investigation initially focused on Gino Owen, two digits away, but he was quickly ruled out. The Los Angeles lead was pursued, but authorities there found no record of such a person. The man's fingerprints were sent to the Justice Department's investigative office, and the FBI's predecessor found no match. A public appeal for information was made, resulting in 50 people trying to identify the body, including a taxi driver named Robert Laney. He claimed to have transported a similarly injured man one night. However, hotel staff couldn't confirm anyone leaving the hotel that night. The police only received one report of seeing the man outside the hotel, visiting multiple bars with two unknown women. Following the first bellboy's report, the authorities went to the place, but a man named Roland T. Owen did not stay there, but the staff recognized the mysterious man and told them that he had booked a room with them under the name of Eugene K. Scott. About a week later, a wrestling manager named Tony Bernotti identified the man as someone he knew as Cecil Werner. In early December 1934, he had asked Bernotti to arrange some matches for him. But the strangeness didn't end there. In March 1935, the Melody Mortuary, where the body was placed, announced that the city cemetery would be the burial site for the unidentified. The news sparked public interest due to the case's absurdity. Soon after, an anonymous caller contacted the mortuary, asking to postpone the ceremony until money could be sent for a proper burial in Memorial Park Cemetery. The caller hinted that the mysterious deceased might be close to his sister. Though warned to inform the police, the caller wasn't concerned and explained that those who cheat on others get what they deserve. The caller then hung up. The funeral was delayed, and on March 23rd, a newspaper-wrapped package containing $25 was delivered to the mortuary. Adjusted for inflation, this amount equals $477 today. Shortly afterward, two calls were made from a payphone to a local florist, requesting a bouquet of 13 red roses for the funeral. Two $5 bills were included in two envelopes, with one carrying a card reading, I love you forever. Only police attended the funeral, and investigators stood guard at the grave for days, but no one came. Interestingly, the ceremony was led by a pastor from the Roanoke Christian Church. A week later, a woman called a local newspaper, the Kansas City Journal Post, stating that their earlier report on the burial was incorrect. The man received a proper funeral, but the details were elusive. Before hanging up, the woman mentioned that the man in room 1046 got into some trouble, and ominously added that the twists in the story were far from over. The attempts to identify the man continued. His story appeared in many American newspapers, but success eluded for a long time. Then, suddenly, Ruby Ogletree from Birmingham, Alabama, came into the picture. 
A friend showed her an article about the case in the fall of 1936 and she believed she recognized her son, Artemis Ogletree, in it. According to her, the man in the newspaper greatly resembled her son and the scar on his temple matched. This scar was acquired when her son was a child, involved in an accident where hot grease spilled on him. She stated that Artemis was born in Florida in 1915 and was 19 years old at the time of the events. In April 1934, he left home to hitchhike to Los Angeles, and even after arriving, he regularly stayed in touch. The man often sent money back home. The woman provided enough information about her son to the police to successfully identify him, and it might seem like the end of the story. However, Ruby Ogletree continued to receive letters in Artemis's name even after his death, with her son listed as the sender. One of these letters, bearing a Chicago postmark, was written in early 1935 using a typewriter, a curious detail since her son didn't know how to use one. The writing style was also markedly different from Artemis's previous letters. In May, another letter arrived, claiming that her son would be traveling to Europe that day. Both letters were mailed from New York. Three months later, an unknown man called Ruby on the phone, asserting that her son had saved his life in a brawl. He explained that Artemis couldn't call lately because he had fallen in love with a wealthy Egyptian woman and moved to Cairo with her. The man couldn't write due to losing a thumb in the same fight where Artemis had saved his life. They talked for about half an hour, but Ruby felt the man was rambling, yet she could glean what had actually happened to her son. The caller never disclosed his name, which the police never made public. The Cairo story was also weakened as no ship company had records of Artemis Ogletree or any of his aliases among their passengers. Similarly, the local US embassy found no trace of him. In the later stages of the investigation, detectives discovered that he temporarily stayed in a third hotel, the St. Regis Hotel in Kansas City, with a man. There was speculation that this man might be the elusive Don from room 1046, but no evidence pointed to this mysterious figure. Despite the unidentified man eventually being identified, the culprits were never apprehended. Around 2012, Dr. John Arthur Horner, a researcher, delved deeper into the case. He received a phone call nine years earlier from an unknown person inquiring about the room 1046 case. The mysterious caller revealed that they were working on organizing the estate of a recently deceased elderly person and found a box among the belongings. This box was filled with cut-out newspaper articles about the case, but the intriguing part was something not mentioned in the articles. The caller, despite repeated questions, refused to disclose what it was and hung up. The mysterious dead man was likely finally identified, but the perpetrators were never caught, leaving the case essentially unsolved. What do you think could be behind the man's murder? Share your opinions and ideas in the comments, and let's solve the mystery together.